Between you and me are the mysteries of heaven. You ask me to follow. I ask you to lead. Between you and me is the distance between creator and creation. I call it eternity, but you call it sacred space. Good afternoon, man. I'm glad you guys are here today. I just want to start off today just by praying. Whenever we have a week like this, some of you haven't, you know, read the news as the body count continues to go up in Paris, France. You know, it's just, it's just one of those times when we, we need God. We, we need God right now. And specifically, we need to know which God we need. Because those who have committed the crime are doing so in the name of God, and those of us who are on the other side of the crime are grieving in the name of God. And so now more than ever, which God you pray to and which God you're worshiping and which God is motivating you is essential to connecting with him. So would you just kind of lift your hands today as we just pray out to God and we say, God, would you meet us in this place as we pray for those who grieve in France, as we pray for our own lives and our own need to connect with God. Let's just pray today. Heavenly Father, God, all of us are here today. Lord, none of us is perfect. God, all of us have, have fallen short, Lord, in, in many, many ways. And God, we connect with you today in, in, in such a way, God, that our humility would allow us to draw close to you. God, we, we as sinners pray for those who are grieving in France today. We, we lift them up in your name. Lord, we, we pray for uh, a Muslim world, Lord, that is, is grieving as well, many of them in fear of the retaliation that's going to take place. God, we just pray, Lord, for your healing touch upon our world your healing touch upon our broken hearts and your healing touch on our broken lives. Jesus, we need you now more than ever. We need the kingdom that you promised, the world that you said you would build. And Father, we just await for that in this moment. But until you come, Lord, we ask in the name of Jesus that you would just heal, touch, and give hope and spread love. We pray this in Christ's name, amen. You know, it's, it's, it's always amazing when, when, we, when we reach out to God and, and some of you, you know, you've come here today for the first time and you're looking around and you're checking it out and you're not quite sure what's supposed to happen. And I, and I just want you to know that I, I think you have a better picture of what church is supposed to be than those of us who come every week. Because a lot of us, we get in a rut, we get in a routine, and we anticipate exactly what's going to happen. And, and for those of us who are unsure, man, you're in a really, really cool place because God is so much more likely to meet you than for those of us who say, well, he's gonna do this, we're gonna sing three songs, there's gonna be a prayer, I'm gonna shake this person's hand I don't like, I'm gonna wash off my hands, get the Ebola off, and I'm gonna listen to a message and go home. Okay, right? Many of us, we, we, we get the game. And because of that, we, we miss out on the encounter. And so I just want you today to, to make a commitment to, to be a novice, to step out of your comfort zone and say, God, do whatever you want to do. I'm going to let you out of this box that I've put you in, and I'm going to allow you to move because, God, you are wild and you are not tame, and you go where you want to go, and you claim what you want to claim, and you save what you want to save. We're going to talk for the next couple of weeks about sacred space. But in order to do that, today we, we have to start with asking this question, what makes a sacred space. What is it? For some of you, you know, you're out in the wilderness, you know, and you haven't showered in days and that's sacred. You know, to me, that's hell. But to you, that's sacred. You're like, oh, I love the smell of my BO. And I'm like, no, I don't. I don't, I don't ever want to smell myself, right? But for some of you, man, close to nature is close to God. Some of you, you know, you're just an epic worshiper. The second music plays, you're like, oh my gosh, this is the moment. We're in heaven. And some of you, when the music plays, you're like, I'm in hell. Hurry up and preach, right? I mean, we're all over the place. So what makes a space sacred? We're gonna to learn today from the life of Moses that any space can become a sacred space. Moses is probably the most important figure in the entire Bible other than Jesus. Matter of fact, there's a, there's a whole book in the New Testament called Hebrews where the whole point of the first few chapters is just telling Christians that Jesus is actually more important than Moses. That's how important Moses was, that Christians have to get their calculators right and be, okay, Moses is awesome, but Jesus is God. And they've got to reset the calibrations. That's how important Moses was. Moses is defined as a man who knew God face to face. Can you imagine? Knew God face to face. But he didn't always know God. 
There was a time in Moses' life where he didn't have a clue about God. And that's where some of you are today. You don't have a clue who God is or what he's doing or what he's saying. And my prayer is that you would meet him today. So let's begin in the scriptures in Exodus chapter 3, verse 1. The text says that one day Moses was tending the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian. Now what does this verse mean? Nothing extraordinary. I mean, he could literally say, one day Moses was working at Starbucks as a barista serving hot coffee. One day Moses was flipping burgers at In-N-Out. One day Moses was in mathematics class, in a math class beyond himself. One day Moses was on his way to work. One day Moses was stuck on the 91 freeway. Nothing extraordinary about this day at all. And that's the first step to understanding how God wants to meet you. Oftentimes, we think an encounter with God has to be teed up, right? I have to be all perfect. I have to be all clean. Everything's got to be confessed. Everything's got to be right. The music, the church, the setting. It's all got to be perfect, and then God will show up. What I want you to see here is there was nothing perfect about this day. It was just like any other day. Moses wasn't doing his dream job. He was doing what he had to do to pay the bills, okay? Nobody grows up and says, I want to herd sheep out by, by myself out in the wilderness, like nobody, nobody says that, right? At least nobody in their right mind. So Moses one day was tending the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian. Look at this on your text. It says he led the flock far into the wilderness. Moses is in the middle of nowhere. Moses thinks he's all alone. Moses thinks he's away from everything, right? I mean, surely if God is gonna move today, it's gonna be in New York City. It's gonna be in Los Angeles. It's gonna be in London. It's gonna, it's gonna be in Paris, right? God's gonna move in a big way in the big cities, And so Moses is as far away from the center of population, from the center of civilization as possible. He's in the middle of nowhere. Even today, it's the Sinai Desert. You saw the pictures of the Russian airplane that was blown up out of the sky. It crashed in the Sinai Desert. And you saw, I mean, the reason they found every part is because there's nothing else out there. There's nothing out there. And there wasn't anything out there, you know, thousands of years ago. It's Moses, sheep, and the darkness. There's nothing. He led the flock far into the wilderness and he came to Sinai. Underline these words, the mountain of God. He doesn't know it's the mountain of God. He doesn't know it's the place where he's gonna meet God. You know what it is? It's a dirty rock, okay? It's like our mountains in, in, in Southern California, not particularly pretty, right? In Riverside, what do we have on our hills? Rocks and dirt, awesome. Nothing spectacular. This isn't Yosemite. This isn't Yellowstone. He's not in Kauai. He's in the middle of a desolated desert. He's where things go to die. And yet, he's going to meet the living God. There, the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a blazing fire from the middle of the bush. Now, the English is a little uh, off here from what the Hebrew says. You know, when we see angel of the Lord, we, we think of a little fat, you know, chubby baby with wings, right? It's, this is not an angel. Really, the Hebrew reads this way. It says, Malak, angel, right? Yahweh. It is the messenger God. It is God messaging himself. This is an encounter with the living God. This isn't an encounter with an angel. This is an encounter with God manifesting himself in our reality, in our world. The angel Lord appeared to him in a blazing fire from the middle of a bush. Moses stared in amazement. Wow, why? There's nothing going on. What are you gonna do? You're in the wilderness by yourself. Looking after sheep, that's boring. He stares in amazement. Look at this. Though the bush was engulfed with flames, it didn't burn up. This is something extraordinary. His life just went from ordinary to extraordinary. His life went from completely natural to totally supernatural. It says, though the bush was engulfed with flames, it didn't burn. Moses says, this is amazing. Why isn't this bush burning up? I must go see it. When the Lord saw Moses coming to take a closer look, he called to him from the middle of the bush, Moses, Moses. So first the bush is on fire. It doesn't burn. Now it's talking. Like Moses is like, what did I smoke? What what just happened here? Right? What is going on? Did I eat some bad mushrooms? I'm not exactly sure what is going on. He's tripping out, right? I mean, and just news for you, if you're in the middle of, you know, Joshua tree and a bush is on fire but doesn't burn and it starts talking to you, I would encourage you to examine yourself. You know, what'd you drink? What are you doing? It might not be God. Maybe you smoked weed. I don't know what you did. Moses didn't smoke weed. 
Moses just had an encounter with God. So when the Lord saw Moses coming to take a closer look, he called to him from the middle of the bush and he says, Moses, Moses, the bush knows his name. That's creepy, right? Moses. I don't know if that's what it sounded like, but that's how I would have did if I was God. Like, I mean, wouldn't you mess with Moses just a little? It'd be too tempting, right? Moses. Moses. Here I am, Moses replied. God says, don't come any closer. Whoa, whoa, stop. Don't come any closer, the Lord warned. Why? Because he's encountering the living God. And, and to encounter the living God face to face means to die. God is so holy, so powerful. We cannot encounter him. That's why Jesus Christ shields us from the glory of God. To look, to look upon the face of God is worse than looking into the face of the sun. Literally, the sun is so glorious, it will burn your corneas. God is so glorious, it will burn your flesh. God is that powerful, that bright, that grand. He says, take off your, your sandals, for you are standing on holy ground. He says, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. And when Moses heard this, he covered his face. Why? Because he's having an encounter with the living God. And he was afraid to look at God. You know why you're not afraid of God? Because you don't know who God is. That's why you're not afraid. You know, I always tell our church this, Hollywood always makes movies about how scary the devil is. Why don't we make a movie about what the devil's afraid of? You ever think about that? You ever think about that? Let's make a movie where the devil and demons run. <laughs> Let's make that movie. Because you know what the devil's afraid of? God. Because when God spoke, the devil got his butt kicked and he was kicked out of heaven forever, forever. When the Lord speaks, it happens. God speaks into the darkness and when he says, let there be light, light doesn't say, hold on. Light happens. It exists. God's thoughts are reality. When God speaks, things are created. You see, I want you to write this down. Sacred space never looks like you think it should. So whatever your idea of sacred space is, whatever your idea of holiness is, whatever your religious upbringing is, whatever it is that you think holy space, sacred space should look like, I just want you to know you're wrong. You're wrong. Some of you have these ideas of what holy space is. Some of you can't worship because you don't see a cross. I don't, there's not a cross in here, I can't worship. You know, it's a magical tea for you. It's just like, there we go. Without it, you can't connect. Do you know that the church never rallied around the cross in the early years? They rallied around the symbol of a fish. Some of you didn't even know that. If you would have drawn a picture of the cross to the early church, they would have been, and, you know, right, that's only one letter. I need, I need a vowel to know what you're saying. You know, the church after it rallied around the symbol of the fish. It rallied around the letters ichthus, meaning Jesus Christ, the Son of God. They rallied around his name. It wasn't for centuries later until the cross became the focal point of what it means to be a Christian. And for so many of us, we're, we're trapped, right? So the church has to look a certain way. Some of you are completely uncomfortable because you're like, I'm sitting in a chair. It feels like a theater. Well, yeah, because we bought those chairs from Regal. That's why it feels like a theater, okay? <laughs> Okay, you're like, this is a strange, if you smell a, a, just a hint of popcorn, you know, we did our best to clean them. But that's reality. Like, well, why'd you buy Regal seats? Because they were cheap. That's why. So the next time you're sitting in Regal Theater in the luxury seats, if you wonder where the old ones went, there they are. There they are, right? Because that's how we roll at Sandals. We're cheap. Come on, you know what you give. We got to work with that, right? Yeah. <laughs> you write the checks, that's why you're sitting on popcorn. Okay. I won't even mention the pieces of gum that we had to pull off those seats. I won't, I'm not even going to go there. But it was gross. It was gross. You see, sacred space never looks like what you think it should. And you know why that's a problem? That's why you always miss out on God moving because God rarely moves in space that you think he should move. Right, it's Easter Sunday, God's gotta move. 
No, he moved 2,000 years ago on Easter Sunday. He moved out of the grave, but he didn't stay there. He keeps moving. He never stops moving. Sacred space never, ever looks like you think it should. I mean, I've been to some of the holiest sites, whatever that means, in the world. I've been to Angkor Wat in Cambodia, right? It was a Hindu temple to Vishnu, then it was a Buddhist temple, then it was a Hindu temple, then it was a Buddhist temple, depending on whatever army won, right? I've been to Jerusalem. It's been the epicenter of Israel, then Christianity, then Muslims, now all three, and they all fight. I've been to Bethlehem, right? I mean, come on, the church in Bethlehem, that's got to be a cool place. I mean, I was born in Kaiser. That's not holy. <laughs> Jesus Christ was born in a cave in Bethlehem. Man, I've been there. And I got, I got to be honest with you, I was disappointed. I was disappointed. I remember a couple years ago, man, I was so excited. We were going to go to Notre Dame in Paris. One of the most beautiful churches ever constructed in the history of Christianity. I mean, just epically gorgeous. You can't imagine, okay? They didn't buy their chairs from Regal Cinema. We went there, man, and I was so excited. We took the train from London. We got up at 4 a.m. My kids were all grumpy. We're all irritated. We finally got to Notre Dame, man. I'm going to walk in this place, and I got my headphones on, and they're translating the French to English because I can't speak French, and they're going to tell me everything about this whole place, and I'm walking in there, and I'm ready for God to move. This is gorgeous. This is the most spectacular thing I've ever seen. I mean, it was like my double rainbow moment. You know what I'm saying? It's a double rainbow. What could this mean? And there's this tug on my shirt. There's this tug. And I'm like, well, I'm up here. What's down there? I'm up here. God, you're going to move. My son is, Dad, I got to poop. <laughs> I'm like, poop? We're in Notre Dame. He says, I got to go, Dad. We had just come from Africa. And when you come from Africa, when you think you have to poop, you better, you better make your way somewhere because it's coming. He says, Dad, I got to go. You know, there's no restrooms in Notre Dame. You got to walk out. I just was, I'm here to meet God Almighty. And now I'm on the throne with my son and he's pooping. I'm like, this is not holy. This is hell. I want you to know, man, there was poop all over the ground in this moment with Moses. How do I know that? Because sheep were there. The sheep didn't know, at all, don't poop. There's poop everywhere. That's why Moses is wearing sandals, so he doesn't get it in his toes. He's a shepherd. He lives with poo all day long. God says, Moses, take off your sandals. Lord, there's poo. Well, it's holy poo now. Take off your sandals because the place you are standing is holy. It's holy. You see, sacred space never thinks like you think it should. It never looks the way that you think it should. And so some of you, you have this picture, this, this idea of what the church has to be. Like when I grew up in a church, you had an American flag, you had the Christian flag, you had a big Bible in the middle uh, over a table that said, in remembrance of me. And I always thought that's, that's what every church everywhere looked like. For some of you, you grew up Catholic and there's cool statues and paintings, you know, and gold everywhere. And it's awesome. I mean, some of you, right, you know, the, the pastors wore costumes and you're all irritated because he's not even wearing a suit and he's got jeans on and I'm pretty sure he's, that's the devil, right? And you're just like, what is going on? You don't get it. Yeah, he should wear a suit. It's not respecting Jesus. Jesus never wore a suit. I mean, God never, ever creates sacred space and feels like he has to make it look the way that you think. I want you to notice that God here, right, he moves in the middle of the desert. He moves on a mountain, which really probably, right, there's not a lot of mountains in this area. It's probably a big rock. So think like Mount Rubido, right? <laughs> the mountain of God. That's Mount Rubido, bro. It's a mountain of God. <laughs> and God sets a little shrub on the side of Mount Rubido on fire. I mean, if I would have been in God's PR department, I would have said, let's transport Moses to, to Yosemite. Anybody been to Yosemite? That's awesome, right? You're just like, oh, it's just like incredible. You just want to eat granola. <laughs> right, ladies, stop shaving everything. Just be like, oh my gosh, oh my gosh. 
God is here. Right? I mean, Yellowstone will turn anyone into a knitter, right? You're just like, oh my gosh, this is so awesome. I want to bake, make clothes. Or maybe God could have transported him, right, to Yellowstone and appeared in a grizzly bear. Anybody, anybody, would, would you listen to a grizzly bear if it started talking? Moses, Moses, that's awesome, right? Moses wouldn't just have been standing in sheep poo, right? <laughs> Moses, you pooed. That's a bear. Can you imagine? Or maybe Kauai, man, the island of God, right? It's considered one of the, one of the most beautiful places on earth. The Valley of the King, right? With, with, with its 3,000 foot cliffs into just turquoise water. That would have been the place. No, God chooses Mount Rubido in the middle of the desert and he sets a bush on fire. Why? Because God doesn't care what you think. He rolls however he wants. Why'd you set the bush on fire? Because I want to. You know the bush is probably the one thing in your backyard that you would think has to go? That's an ugly bush. God's like, set that on fire. Why? You want to know why you're so frustrated with God? Anybody ever get frustrated with God? You can raise your hand. It's not a set up question, right? You get frustrated. God's not answering your prayers. God's not doing what you think he should do. God's not running the world that you think the world should be run. Let me just help you out here. If you want to be less frustrated with God and you want to understand God on a deeper level, memorize Isaiah 55, 8 and never forget it. The next time you just say, I don't know what God is doing. Isaiah 55, 8. God says, my thoughts are not your thoughts. My ways are not your ways, declares the Lord. So the next time you're irritated that the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, the one who makes the earth spin and float, isn't running the world the way you think it should. Go back to Isaiah 55 eight. God doesn't move the way you think he should move. God doesn't think the way that you think. God doesn't do what you think he should do. You know, a lot of times as Christians, we pray like we're God and God's the follower. We get it completely backwards. And we get irritated and we get angry because the God of the universe doesn't answer my every whim. We're like, God, I've been good. He's not Santa. God, I've been good this year. Why didn't I get a promotion? Why didn't I get a husband? Why didn't I get a wife? Why can't we have a kid? God, we've been so good. Because a lot of times we confuse God with Santa, right? He's checking his list, checking it twice. Looking for who's naughty, who's been nice, right? Let me tell you something. Moses has been naughty. He's not been good. He killed somebody in Egypt. That's why he's in the wilderness. He killed somebody. He got angry. He needs to go to anger management. God says, Moses. You see, he says, my thoughts are not your thoughts, and neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. God can move however he wants to move. God can do whatever he wants to do. I remember when we, when we came to this building, I was so irritated with God. God, why this place? God doesn't care what I think. God says, this is the place. This is the place. God, there's nothing up here but donkeys. God says, you'll be with friends. Right? That was it. Bunch of wild donkeys staring at me. This is your church, Matt. <laughs> Sacred space never thinks, never looks like you think it should. Next, write this down. Sacred space, what makes something sacred is God's presence. You see, too, all too often we fall in love with the thing and we fall out of love with God. And so for some of you, the symbol of God in your life has become more important than God in your life. And so that's why you can only connect with God in a Catholic church because you grew up in a Catholic church. And so God has to move in a Catholic church. You can, you can only connect with God in a Baptist church because God, you know, you grew up in a Baptist church. You can only connect with God when they sing hymns. You can only connect with God, you know, when they sing like, you know, 1970s Jesus movement stuff. You've been captivated by what God did in the past and you're now imprisoned by it. You can't move on. Oftentimes we fall in love with what God did at one time and we fail to see what God is doing now. 
You see, oftentimes what God uses to save a generation oftentimes condemns the next generation. I'll give you an example. In the Bible, the people of Israel are sinning. They're going their own way. God warns them. God warns them. God warns them. They keep sinning. They keep going their own way. Finally, God says, fine, I've had enough. And he allows venomous vipers from all over the desert literally to come into the camp and they start biting people. There's so many snakes in the camp of Israel, 23,000 Israelites die in a day. And the people of God are like, what do we do? And Moses is like, listen to me. And he holds up this staff that has a snake on it. It has a carved image of a snake on it. And he holds it up and he says, everyone who looks at this will live. And all of the people of Israel stare at this, this, this pole that has a snake on it. And they're like, oh my gosh, and everybody lives. And it's awesome. And God uses that staff to save the people of Israel. But you know what happens? The people of God become so enamored with the staff, they stop worshiping God and start worshiping the staff. And it becomes so bad that ultimately a king of Israel eventually has to destroy it. He says, you guys have forsaken God because you're worshiping the thing God used. And what God used in a previous generation was now condemning the current generation. You see, what makes something sacred is God's presence. It's what makes it sacred. Man, I've been to religious ruins all over the world, and you know what they are? They're ruins. You know what a ruin is? It's ruined. It's ruined. And people always go to these ruins, these places where God moved at one time, and they expect to encounter God again. The problem is God left a long time ago. In the Bible, it says that one time the Shekinah glory, the glory of God was in the temple. But the priests talk about the fact that the Shekinah glory, the glory of God hadn't been seen in centuries. And that's why when Jesus shows up, he says this place is going to get torn down. Why? Because it was already ruined. It was already ruined. You see, what makes something sacred is God's presence. It isn't a statue. It isn't a thing. It isn't a cross. It isn't a symbol. Some of you pray to the cross around your neck or the beads around your arm like God's presence is in that. You know when Rome finally conquered Israel? When they finally destroyed Israel, the Roman emperor clamored and desired to know what's in this house of God. What's in it? What's in there? What are they storing in there? They thought there'd be all kinds of gold statues, incredible things, awesome things. And the generals of the Roman army, as they destroyed Israel and they crashed the gates of the temple of God and they went into the holiest of holies, they were gravely disappointed. Because when they came into the holiest of holies, the most sacred spot on the temple mount, the very center, the epicenter of God's presence, they came into the building and guess what they found? Nothing. Nothing. Why? because it was never about a statue. It was never about a thing. It was always about the presence of God. And his presence was gone. Jesus gets so frustrated with the religious people of his day. He says, woe to you, you blind guides. He says, you who say, if someone swears by the temple, it's nothing. But if someone swears by the gold in the temple, then he is bound by his oath. He says, you blind fools, which is greater, the gold or the temple that has made the gold sacred? Jesus' question is this, is what makes something sacred? The answer is this, the presence of God. This bush that's on fire is more sacred than any piece of gold in the history of the world because it is illuminating God's presence. Listen, this place, this building, it's just a building if God's presence is not here. If God's presence is not filled. If God is not here, this is just a warehouse and it should be sold. Listen, why are we asking you to pray about, you know, giving to reach so that we can build more stuff? No so that we can make more room for people so that they can experience God's presence. That's why we're doing this. We don't exist to build buildings. We exist to encounter God and to experience his glory. You were made for God and God made you for him. The Bible says that the right hand of God are pleasures forevermore. 
There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a blazing fire from the middle of the bush and Moses stared in amazement. Why? Because God was present. Some of you have never feel, feel, felt this. You've never experienced the presence of God. Your faith in God is just some, some mental exercise. You, you, you think there's a God. You've mentally rationalize that there's a God, but you've never encountered him. You've never felt him. And why? Because we set up barrier after barrier after barrier. And we say, God has to move in this way. God has to move in this place. God can't move in a warehouse. God can't move in a gym. God can't move in my home. When the reality is God can move wherever he wants. And Moses just stared in amazement. Why? Why? Because God is always creating space to connect with me. Why have we built this building? Why, why have we built this place? Because God has called us to create a place where you can be real, where you can connect with him, a place where you're safe, a place where you can connect with God, a place where you're not judged, a place where you're loved, and a place where you're pointed to Jesus. You see, we all need a sacred place where we can be real. You know what destroys sacred places faster than anything? When we become inauthentic, when we're not real, when we feel like we have to pretend. Man, God meets Moses in a powerful way on the side of this hill in a burning bush and God says, Moses, I'm going to use you to set my people free. Look what the text says. It says, but Moses protested to God. Why? That's what people do. He says, who am I to appear before Pharaoh? Who am I to lead the people of Israel out of Egypt? And that's where some of you are today. You don't believe that God would ever meet you because you don't believe that God would actually use you. Oh, that's for, that's for other people. That's for people who got it together. That's for, that's for people who are righteous. That's for people who've never messed up. That's for people who've never screwed up. That's for people who are super holy. That's like for my grandma, my mom. You know, they pray every day. They read their Bible every day. That's not for me. And one of the primary reasons you never experience God in sacred space is because you never believe God would invite you into sacred space. You know, Moses gives five excuses he protests five times why God's got the wrong guy. Isn't that interesting? God, the maker of heaven and earth. God who makes the earth spin and float. God who spoke and the heavens came into existence. God who knows how far the east is from the west. God who knows the beginning, the middle, and the end. God who knows everything about everything got the wrong guy. Isn't that interesting? Moses thinks God's picker's broke. And that's where some of you are today. God, you could never use me to change my family. God, you could never use me to share the gospel. God, you could never use me to serve at church. God, you could never use me to change the world. Listen to me, husbands. You know the number one reason you don't pray with your wife? Because you're afraid you're not good enough. Inadequacy is the enemy the devil uses to make us all feel like we're not good enough. And I got news for you, you're not but I got good news for you, God is. And he is in the business of using broken people to heal a broken world. You can pray over your wife and children, guys, not because of who you are, but because of who he is. You can. You can be the leader that God's called you to be, not because of who you are, but because of who God is. You see, we all need a sacred place where we can be real with ourselves. Moses says five times, you got the wrong guy. I can't go to Moses. I mean, I can't lead the people. What are they, they're not gonna trust me. I can't confront Pharaoh. I can't speak. I can't, I can't, I can't. Moses says, you got the wrong guy. And isn't it interesting that Moses thinks God has called the wrong guy because Moses won't have the courage to confront Pharaoh, but Moses has the courage to confront God five times. <laughs> Let me tell you something, you, if you can tell God no, you can tell anyone no. If you can confront God, you can confront anyone. He is confronting a bush on fire that does not burn. I think Moses, I think God got the right guy. What do you think? I think God knows who he's talking to. And God wants to pick you, God wants to choose you, God wants to use you, not to destroy you, 
Not to use you and throw you away, but to empower you and to enable you to be the person he has called you to be. Why? Because we live in a world where people need to be real with God. I want you to notice this. God creates sacred space so that we can be real with others, so that we can share the experience. The Lord told him, he says, I have certainly seen the oppression of my people in Egypt. I have heard their cries of distress because of their harsh slave drivers. Can you underline this last sentence? Yes, God says, I am aware of their suffering. Do you know who's more broken about what happened in France than the French people? God. He loves them. He loves them. God not only loves the French people, but he loves those who blew up the French people. And he looks at our world as broken and fractured and he sees our suffering. And here's the beauty. If you're suffering, if you're hurting, I want you to know that God is not unaware. And here's the beauty. Here's the beauty. God is calling someone to you to help save you. And let me tell you, God is calling you to other people who are hurting to help save them. God says, Moses, I have heard the misery of my people and I am sending you. To what? To set them free. Do you know why? So that they can worship him. What sets people free is not freedom. What sets people free is worship. You see, the people in Egypt were not allowed to worship God. They were not allowed to connect with God. And God said, I'm gonna create a space, the promised land, so that you can connect with me. Write this down, a sacred space that becomes a selfish place is no longer sacred. The moment Sandals Church becomes just about you, just about you and God, it's no longer sacred. When something becomes selfish, it's no longer sacred. The only way that Sandals Church remains sacred is if it's shared. And I know the church is getting big. I know it's growing. I know it's scary. But the only way to ensure God's presence remains is if we continue to share his presence with others. But the churches who say us for and no more, you know what God says? Okay, I'm out. That's, there's no room for me. When Tammy and I first became uh, involved in ministry, we got a job at our very first church, and I'll never forget this. It was our very first Sunday at a new church. I'd just been hired. I sat on the front row where you guys are sitting. We were ready to hear the pastor preach. And as the pastor got up to preach, this old couple came and tapped me on the shoulder. I'll never forget what he said. He said, you're sitting in my seat which was weird because it wasn't a seat, it was a pew, and there weren't names on it. And I, I, was, I was so young and stupid, I actually looked back to see if there was a name. He wasn't kidding, and he, star- he gave me like the Jesus stare. Tammy and I just moved, because it was his seat. The moment it becomes your seat, God's leaving. God's leaving. We have got to be with God We've got to create a space where we can be real with God. I'm gonna close with these, these words and this thought. Moses again protested. He says, if I go to the people of Israel and tell them, the God of your ancestors has sent me to you, they will ask me, what's his name? Right, Moses is a man of excuses, excuse after excuse after excuse. He says, what's his name? And then who should I tell them sent me? And what's amazing, don't you love God? God could have struck him dead at this moment, right? But you know what God does? He says, you wanna know my name? And God replied to Moses. He says, my name is I am who I am. He says, say this to the people of Israel. I am has sent me to you. And God also said to Moses, he said, say to this people of Israel, Yahweh, the God of your ancestors, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my eternal name, my name to remember for all generations. What's interesting is, what's the name of God? He doesn't have one. Why? Well, why do you have a name? Do you know why you have a name? Because your parents gave, some, somebody gave you your name. Infants don't go, I want to be Bob. <laughs> Babies don't come out with their name written on them. 
Every child is named. Why? Because someone precedes them. Names are something that are received from someone who has come before. But what happens if no one ever came before you? Then your name is I am. I have always been. God is the Alpha, the Omega. He is the beginning and the end. He is the one who was, who is, and who will be. And here's the beauty. He says to Moses, you tell them, the one who was, who is, and is to be, it will be. He says, you tell them, I am is with you. Listen to me, church. God wants you to hear these same words. I am with you. I am in your marriage. I'm in your finances. I'm in your home. I'm in your studies. I am with you. Jesus promised these words. He says, even if heaven and earth pass away, he said, I will never forsake you. Isn't that beautiful? Isn't that amazing? No matter how many times you've forsaken God, no matter how many times you've abandoned God, the great I am has never left you. And he is with you here today. And you know why I know he's here? Because Jesus promised this. Wherever two or more, and look around, there's definitely more than two, are gathered together in my name, in the name of the great I am, he says, I am what? With you. Amen. So we're going to close the service today with a time of worship. And, and I, want, I, want you to, I want you to stretch with me a little bit. This might make you uncomfortable. But I want you to stand with me and I want you to slip your shoes off. It may not smell like heaven in here. But we're going to trust God in this. So just stand up wherever you are. And, and I'm going to slip my shoes off with you. And this is why. Holy ground never looks like what you think it should look like. It never feels like what you think it should feel like. And because it doesn't look like holy ground, because it doesn't feel like holy ground, we miss out on holy ground. And I don't want you to miss out today. I want you to encounter God because he is here. He's with you. He's with us. He will never leave us. He will never forsake us. Would you bow your head and close your eyes as I pray over you? I'm gonna ask the worship team to come on out and we're gonna enter into a time of worship. Heavenly Father, I pray that every person that is here today would just feel your presence, would just sense your love. God, so many of us, we feel so guilty. We feel so ashamed. We feel so far from you. God, can I just confess on behalf of us all, Lord, that we're sinners we are not right with you, but we need you to be right with us today. We need your presence in our homes, in our finances, in our friendships. We need your presence in our work. God, we need you. We can't live the life we're meant to live without you. And so God, we just invite your spirit in this place. We just invite you to take over this place and to move in the hearts of your people, not because of who we are, but because of who you are. God, just touch us today. Touch every single one of us today. We pray in the name of Jesus Christ. And we declare this space, this place, sacred ground.